Hello there. Former Prime Minister Gordon Brown has put forward his 40-point plan to completely reshape the UK, and Keir Starmer is backing it. Now, if you haven't already done so, please do subscribe and then like and comment below. Looking through the list of things that Gordon Brown wants the Labour Party to do, it looks like a mammoth task. But it seems that Starmer believes he can do it in the first Labour parliamentary term, or at least most of it. And it will involve the biggest ever transfer of power out of Westminster to get it as close as practicable to the people it affects. And that means relocating 50,000 civil service jobs out of London. Now I remember the Tories promising that, until they messed with the blob. There will also be more powers for the devolved administrations in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. And the big bit of red meat from these proposals is to scale back the indefensible House of Lords and turn it into a fully elected chamber. Something else other wannabe governments have promised until they met the blob. And the House of Lords has been useful for rewards and bribes in the past. There are also plans to clamp down on MPs doing second jobs and set up an anti-corruption commissioner to root out politicians involved in criminal activity and clamp down on sleaze. Won't be many MPs and Lords left after that then. On top of that, it would be a requirement for government to ensure prosperity and investment was spread much more evenly across the UK. Whether that would benefit the Union or the separatists is open to question. I assume Brown is betting that doing this will make people appreciate the Union of the United Kingdom more. But judging by how devolved politics has worked thus far, it would be the devolved administrations who will take all the credit for the good stuff and still blame what's left of Westminster for the rest. Now, one interesting point is that there will now be a council for England, something of a first in the world of UK devolution. But how it slots into all the other councils of regions and nations being banded about is hard to tell. There is also talk that healthcare based on need and not ability to pay will be enshrined in law. And that's red meat for the left and the NHS, of course. Does that mean no more private healthcare insurance and the like? No, no bupa for the rich and powerful? Not sure that will be well received in some quarters. Now, one thing Gordon Brown wants is for this to be a permanent change. How he'll achieve that in a democracy built on the concept that no parliament can bind its successor will be interesting to see. Now, Nicola Sturgeon has pledged to make the next general election a de facto referendum on Scottish independence in Scotland. And when answering questions on this, Gordon Brown said... We are changing that entirely today. We are breaking new ground. The ground on which the battle is fought in Scotland is changing forever because what we are saying is we are offering change within the UK that will benefit Scotland as against change by leaving the United Kingdom which we think will do damage to Scotland. And he went on to say that is going to be the debate from now on in. Not independence versus the status quo, but change within Britain versus change by leaving Britain. Now, one of the things that will inevitably flow from all of this is an explosion in the number of both politicians and the civil service, as more duplication of work will occur. There will be no economies of scale, but there will be an upscale in costs, and one of the powers you can expect will be that of local tax raising, no doubt. And I would worry about the rise in the number of local jobs worths as well. Now, I've always looked on Gordon Brown as a bit of a micromanager where politics is concerned and would view anything he wants to put in place as designed to micromanage our lives rather than enhance them. 
Now, on the House of Lords reforms, Keir Starmer says it would become a scaled-down democratic affair but may not be something he can get done in the first five-year term, he says. And it seems the new name for this more representative body will be the Assembly of the Nations and Regions. But I would say that given the nature of a revising upper chamber, surely it should be an assembly of all the expertise. People with proven abilities across all sectors of our society and economy. People who know how the internal clockwork operates and can, in a non-political manner, tweak proposed laws to make sure they do enhance the statute books for the benefit of the public. And they need to be elected on that basis. What we don't need is another chamber full of party hacks voted for on a geographical basis, locally selected by a few people in political constituency parties or we'll just get more of the same. So I see the Welsh First Minister Mark Drakeford and one of his ministers, Vaughan Gething, have been doing their bit to reduce carbon emissions and reduce support for economies of despotic regimes by spending 13,000 quid of Welsh taxpayers' money to fly to Qatar to watch the World Cup. And Drakeford called it a very special opportunity to promote Wales. And here's where we find out that since 2018, the devolved Welsh government has been running an office in Qatar as part of the Qatar British Business Forum. And the Qatar British Business Forum, the QBBF, is part sponsored by the British Embassy in Doha. And it seems that not even Nicola Sturgeon's SNP has dared to get in on that act with her nine overseas offices – one of which I believe is actually in London. The rest are in Beijing, Dublin, Copenhagen, Brussels, Paris, Ottawa, Washington and Berlin. While the Northern Ireland executive also runs offices abroad, China, Washington and Brussels. And the Mayor of London operates an office in Brussels as well. And according to the Welsh Government statement on the QBBF website, Based at the British Embassy in Doha, the Welsh Government has offices across India and the Middle East. Now I did a quick search and I couldn't find any offices based pushing for England. But hey-ho, that's normal. After all, we don't even have a BBC England. Now one little snippet I missed a few days ago is that we're now being told we can catch the Covids from raspberries and cauliflower. This follows testing by the Food Standards Agency that showed it could live longer on foods with uneven surfaces. Funny how it sticks to really healthy foods like raspberries and broccoli, isn't it? And that we read stories in the press that might make us think twice about buying and eating these wonderful foods. While at the same time, governments around the world, such as in the Netherlands, are busy shutting farms down. You would think that someone wanted us to change our diet to eat bugs or something, or that some clever people had found out how to manufacture Frankenstein foods in a factory. Oh, wait. And finally, when subscribing, please don't forget to press that little bell and also select the all option, or you won't get any notifications when I publish a new video. And thank you all so much for taking the time to watch the show.